in case you haven't figured out, this whole month has been a stress because we've hired people and we're short-handed. So I'm trying to do 30,000 things at one time. Um, there's a lot of things that you're going to encounter throughout your assessments that you may have to figure out what exactly is wrong with this person. And at the same time, can they have multiple medical emergencies? Yeah. yeah. So now you've got to figure out which one's the worst. You treat, that, you treat the worst one first, it gets better. Then you go to number two that's the worst, number three is the worst. So we're going to talk a lot about these different diseases, give you some uh, clues that will help you identify what's wrong with the patient. Maybe you can start to work towards the identification of exactly what is wrong with them so that when you're treating them, you're treating them the right way. Uh, Everything you do as far as your assessment is part of going through a organized pattern. There's those skill sheets you've got, talks about <coughs> scene safety, BSI, number of patients, all those things. It, it takes you into those sheets and using those, trying to create a pattern for you to do your assessment in a more orderly manner. Now, in the real world, do those sheets work for you? The jury's still out, unfortunately. But sometimes those things get to be a little bit more of a burden than what they're good for. And tonight, when we get done this chapter here, because uh, I forgot we've got another thing to do just activity-wise, to help you start working on your medical assessment uh, memory when it comes to those skill sheets, because that's how, again, you're going to, one, pass the test, and then, two, when you're out doing your assessments, use them to try to, to ask the right questions, look for the right things, do the right things, and then treat your patient the right way. So, so what is, first off, major abilities? What is that thing? If I said what the nature of illness is, what is that? Yeah, I mean, that's short, sweet, simple definition, right? It's just what the main plan is. Now, again, can they have multiple nature of illnesses? Yes. Absolutely. So, with that, we're looking at symptoms along with the treatment plan, which they're telling us, again, it goes back to nature of illness. But symptoms being what? What is a symptom? What are you saying? Somebody tell me. It's, it's not visible to you unless it's obvious, right? If it's diaphoresis, if it's nausea, vomiting. I mean, you can see vomiting, can you see nausea? No. Yeah. You can show signs that you're nauseated. But more so often, there will be more signs than symptoms, right? So we need to focus on these kind of things here as we do our assessments to really narrow down what do I need to treat this patient for. Because, again, there may be medications that are administered. Those medications are geared towards only certain conditions. Or it may be something beyond our scope of practice, and we need to go and seek ALS intervention as well as go into the hospital for further care. Hmm? Try and get a good history of your patient. Will that be an easy process? Is the patient always going to be truth? Okay, so that can be problematic. Think about it as far as when you're dealing with a nursing home patient. Where are you going to get your information on nursing home patients from? The caregivers, the nursing staff, they'll have no medical records or something like that. They'll have some generic information for you to be able to find out what's going on with the patient and stuff. So that can be problematic at times. What about family members? You got a caregiver at home that has an elderly patient that they're taking care of, and maybe there's just a, let's see if I can get them out of the picture so I can inherit their money kind of situation going on there. Could they be withholding some information from you? Awesome. So try to get as much as you can, but at the same time understand it may not be easy to do. What's some other things you can do to find out information on maybe an underconscious patient? What's some things you can look for? Yeah, medical point bracelet. To, medical bracelet. Okay. Whether it be a necklace, whether it be a wristband, some of them are like dummy bands or hospital bands. Um, some people have phone apps. There's a phone app out there, I forget what it's called, but you can have it where we have a, a application on our phones that would scan this QR code and then they pop up all the generic information that this person has. The emergency contacts and all that kind of stuff. The iPhone now too, the health app, if somebody has a password on their phone, you can hit the emergency and it'll pull up uh, health information like what that is. Okay. So it's on your phones for the most part. Just, just you know, emergency contacts. So, so all that stuff is there for you to gather that information because again, is medical going to be one of those things where we're going to see a lot of different things from this person? Yeah. We could. But where are we going to gather the majority of our information from? Is it going to be sighted them or from them verbally telling us? <coughs> yeah. That's, that's going to be the thing. They're going to talk more than a trauma patient where you're going to obviously see some damage. Okay? Does the dispatch information always guarantee you what's wrong with the patient? Again, you're going by either the third party caller 
you're going by maybe the victim themselves, they're, they're communicating with the dispatcher and telling them what is wrong, and the dispatcher may ask them 20 questions that they're supposed to be asking, and those 20 questions might say it's this, but in fact it's something else. So not always the dispatcher's fault. Sometimes, unfortunately, they do ask the wrong questions and it does go down the wrong path. So, but sometimes your dispatcher information can work towards helping you identify, hey, as I'm arriving on the scene, what equipment do I need to get off the ambulance and take inside the house? And then again, obviously, don't get locked in the idea that you know exactly what's wrong with this patient. If you run the exact same house five times for the exact same patient, is it always the five times, every time the exact same thing? Not always. 99% of the time, yeah. But at one time, it won't be. So don't automatically start thinking that you're going to the same house for the same person. They must just be having problems again with the same thing. They're walking here and they're all gapped out. You know? the situation's changing. Um, if you have a patient that's not cooperating with you, how easy is it to ask them questions? They want to go to the hospital. They don't want to listen to you ask questions. They want to go now, now, now. You're not going to be able to keep them controlled enough to sit there and go, okay, calm down, and let's just ask questions. No, you're better off get the stretcher, get them in the ambulance, go to the hospital, and ask the questions in the rounds. Be professional. Don't be demeaning to these people. A person that, no matter if it's a frequent flyer or the first time you ever got called to their house, it's not their fault they're having that medical emergency. Most of the time, something has happened to them where they are just not able to keep up with what's happened. I mean, how many people call 911 just for fun? Granted, we have ran some situations, and, and Nathan knew a little bit about that. This guy, he's in the driver's seat of Winchester. I used to volunteer when we were down with the rest of the squad and stuff. And there would be many nights when we would go out to the same person frequently on you know, Friday nights, and it was some voices in our head, you know. But, uh, you know it was, just the average every point will be able to decide in the morning to come out and get the ambulance to go to the hospital. You didn't have to get out of the ambulance, just to win the taxi car. There are those type of people. But then there are people, like I said, they are scared to death they're going to die. They're going to fall in the So you've got to be professional all the time. You can't believe. Um, don't label your patients. Again, don't say they're the frequent flyers or they're the United Airlines pilots are the same ones or anything like that. That's not a good thing. But again, if somebody hears the wrong thing, they're going to keep We've had numerous complaints on our staff and volunteer staff. I mean, it's everywhere. The people being rude to patients. And trust me, that, that little PR is not something that you need for your department. So, so how do you know the scene's safe, first of all? It's going to be at some point. So, how do you make sure your scene is safe? Okay. Identifying patterns, right? Looking for anything that's suspicious that may hurt you. Getting out on the interstate out of your ambulance to attend to a patient in a car accident. So what do you do? Where your best. What else? Make sure you're positioned well enough that nobody's going to nail you. Where else? They're always going to have the emergency lights on. What else? What was the big thing? Don't you always look before you leap out of the truck? Mm -hmm. no. You don't just, hey, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so make sure you're thinking about, is it safe enough for me to get out of the ambulance first? And then when you get out of the ambulance, make sure you're watching all your surroundings. Because again, there are people nowadays shooting us. There are people standing inside a house getting ready to beat the crap out of us. Um, because unfortunately, that's society nowadays. So just understand. You've got to make yourself as safe as possible. If the scene is not safe, what do you do? Call for law enforcement, back up. Keep your lights off, isolate yourself so that way they can't see you until the help arrives, right? Okay. Using standard precautions, your gloves, gown, goggles, mask, whatever you need for whatever the situation warrants. Now, for a patient non bleeding, non sweating, no body fluids coming out of any orifice, do you really need to wear gloves? It's up to you. Yes, you do. There's no harm in doing that. It's your self protection. You're, you're, you're conscious enough that you're thinking, I want to protect myself. So make sure you're aware. If they've got bodily fluids coming out of any orifice, you better have them just to protect yourself. So. All right, so we talked about nature of illness. The thing that you think most often is their problem. Okay? Patients having chest pain, difficulty breathing. What is their major medical problem? 
chest pain, difficulty breathing. Which is the worst? Chest pain. Both of them. You can't have A, B, or C all the above. Sorry. How about figuring out which one is the one that's hurting them the most? Okay. Are they having more trouble breathing? Is their chest pain killing them? You know, which one do you want to treat first? Now, in like the cardiac chapter, we'll say give them some nitro. <clears throat> and maybe that'll relieve the chest pain, which then may make their breathing great. Or maybe they're hypoxic, so you throw some oxygen at them and it makes your chest pain go away. So it's a rule game. You know, you just gotta play out the game and see which one's first. Now, if you go by the machine, what's gonna be the first one to treat? Airway, then <coughs> breathing, right? So you do it while the breathing is treated before your cardiac. So you can do it that way too. The main thing is remember, sometimes symptoms will be hurting something else. You eliminate one, it might eliminate two. You just you've got to play the game. You've got to figure out what's wrong with this person. Treat the higher priority first, and maybe that eliminates all the other ones all together. So as we go through here, you'll see a lot of these different assessments and talking about the different levels as far as the, uh, the patient scenario sheets and stuff like that. First off, as you're arriving on the scene and your patient is sitting in front of you on a chair, start looking at them and saying, what's wrong with them? You don't even need to get information from them yet. If you walk in there, this person is sitting on a chair, you know, struggling to breathe, what's that tell you is wrong with them? Yeah, they can't, yeah, they can't breathe. So you know right off the start, this person is probably going to need some oxygen. So you are going to assume that that's their major priority at the time. Get in the round to see if there's anything that could be obviously wrong with them as far as if there's any uh, paraphernalia, um, any drug bottles, any things that look out of place that may say, hey, that might be a contributing factor to the reason why they're having a problem in the office. Um, a good example is, let's say they have a, uh, a kerosene heater inside their house in the winter. What does kerosene heaters put off? Carbon monoxide, okay? They're all nauseated, headaches, all that kind of stuff. Well, a kerosene heater, an enclosed area, people around it, all symptomatic, most likely carbon monoxide. So you can kind of put pieces together to say what's wrong with them. Those kind of things are what's going to help you in your assessment as far as just looking at the surroundings to see what, if, what else could be wrong with this person. If you walk in and they got pill bottles laying everywhere, what's that say? They got a lot of problems. What is wrong with this person? What's not wrong with this person? You know? It's got every disease according to their doctors. So. All right, so airway-wise, if the patient's talking to you, what's it tell you about their airway? Yeah. Open pad. Breathing, will that be great? Not necessarily. Talking, talking to, to you, you, like, you know, normal sentences, <laughs> one after another. Don't seem to be under stress, you know, the breathing's pretty good. You don't have to worry about it. But if they're talking and they have to, I have to catch my breath as, as I go through because I just, I can't keep up, then you got a problem, right? So make sure you give them air, airway support as adequately as possible. Like I said, I'm not too sure about that lady having a two-word problem and you're going to bag her. I'm just not sold on that yet. Kind of scary. Um, look for your rate, rhythm, quality of your breathing. Make sure it's adequate enough for them to be perfusing properly at the time of the initial assessment, the primary assessment. Give them oxygen. It doesn't hurt to give a person oxygen right from the start. If you walk in and you see that person struggling to breathe, you better be working the oxygen out before you ask them the first question. And don't go, well, I need to get a baseline pulse ox before that. No, bullshit. Give up the oxygen first, worry about the pulse ox later. That pulse ox ain't worth crap. Right? If you look at them and they're struggling to breathe, you know they got to watch. Uh, unconscious, make sure you're doing their airway maneuvers. Which ones are they? Two of them. They're unconscious, how do you open their airway? So the problem patient gets which one? And then check their pulse rates. Okay, now pulse rates, you know, we're always saying we really calculate rates and all that kind of stuff. The primary no. one thing we're looking here is do they have pulse A and is it regular, strong? That's what we want it to be. If it's weak and rapid or irregular, there's a problem. Uh, skin color. How can skin color help you identify what's wrong with the person? It's blue, they have less oxygen in the body. Okay. Yeah, when does blue show up? Sleeping or vaping. Real late, right? They've been out of oxygen for a while. 
So if you walk in, compared to blue or some of your old shirts, ooh, this is bad. Okay? But if it's a patient that has pale, cool, clammy skin, what state of shock are they in? Compensated or decompensated? So, compensated. They're in the early stages, probably. Now, if they start getting really white to mottled color and ain't wet no more, now you've switched over to the dark side. Make sure you're looking at skin condition. Uh, assess their pulses, their unresponsive. Now, unresponsive patients, where do you check them? You check them broad. Unresponsive patients, where do you check their pulse? Radio. 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 Yeah. And then transport. How do you know you need to transport this person? Priority wise. What was the load of goods? Remember, there's an item. Abdominal pain. Unconscious. Severe chest pain. Unconscious. Severe chest pain. Especially with pain that's less than blood pressure of 90. 100. Okay. The test is 100. And you're looking for a pulse that's 90, trust me, I hate that. You're using the 100 as a rule. Extreme difficulty breathing, severe pain anywhere, pain following instructions, complicated childbirth, severe bleeding. Traumatic injury. I'm sorry? Traumatic injury. something to feel for humans, right? But you're making plans. Hey, if this don't fix them, we're going to need to go early, right? So think about doing that early on. Get your history from the patient. Find out anything about it. Again, family members will work if they're not conscious enough for you to do it. Caregivers, bystanders that were there when they passed out. Anything that can give you some clues as to what happened to this person in the last five minutes should be that situation or you know, they've been sick for a couple of days and family members have been taken care of. Well, how have they been these the past couple of days? Get as much information from them. Now, what, what mnemonics do you use to get that information? Sample. Sample, which is S. That's So you get all that stuff from them. Now, from the patient's standpoint, you use mnemonic OPQRST, which is? Radiation, quality, radiation, severity, So get as much information as you can. Because again, this is important for you in this situation. Because the patients that are in a medical emergency, they don't show you what's wrong. You have to find out for yourself what's wrong. Unconscious, you talk about the medical ID bracelet options and stuff like that. Make sure you're doing that. Okay, here's your, your ST guide. Do not. So if you see that, what's that tell that's a high level. So ask your questions on that guy. What what kind of questions am I going to ask him? Okay, radiating pain anywhere. What else? Stabbing pain. Okay, you can be descriptive of your pain. How long is it going to be? One set wise. What were you doing when this happened? Okay. Severity. 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 I think we need to do a 1 to 5 scale. I've never had this little 1 to 10 scale because I think it's too broad. 1 to 5 is pretty simple. If you got it, you don't got it. Somewhere in the middle, yeah, that's about not that bad at all. The 4 or 5, those are major factors, right? So make sure you're explaining to these patients, hey, if you've ever had pain before, you know, how bad is it now compared to what it was then? Is it 1? Is it 10? Whatever scale you're going to use. And make sure you're explaining to them as they're doing that assessment. Uh, what's the difference between onset and time? Because this has been a question a lot of people have been asking. Onset, onset means what? So what time it? means how long? How long? Constant okay. or occasional, right? So. All right. So primary assessment, airway, breathing, circulation, identifying the transport. From there, if you're going to stay on the scene or even during transport, you can do your secondary assessment. 
going to look for the problems with this patient. So secondary assessment for a medical patient, you know, if they say they're having chest pain, difficulty breathing, do you have to check toes? No. Do you have to check kneecaps? No. Backsides? Hit necks? You know, do you have to do a full body assessment on these patients for a secondary assessment? And the answer is probably not. But at the same time, does it hurt? No, it does not hurt at all. Because the thing is, think about it. They may be having a problem here, but it may be somewhere else related. Like, for example, let's say they're uh, having severe trouble breathing. And you, you know, you ask them some questions, and they say, oh, yeah, my legs have been swollen for the past few days. You go down there and you look, and their legs are two times the size. That's not good. That's, that's probably why they're having trouble breathing, because they're so full of fluid. Okay? So always think about you know, what other areas might be involved, or do a full body assessment. You don't see anything, cross that area off. You don't get back to it. Unconscious, you don't have to do a full body no matter what, because again, maybe something you're not seeing up front. So, so we see everything, and there's no point in going over this part in depth because the big thing is it's common sense, right? Start at the head, work your way to the feet, check the back legs. Look for anything that looks abnormal. How will you know it's abnormal? What's your reference guy? Both sides. How? Both sides. Well, I mean, is it abnormal? Yeah, how would you know something's that normal? What can you use as a reference? Yeah, I I, I'm an Encyclopedia Britannica. How are you doing? I am the person I can look at and say, or he's my partner, and we're driving down the road, that doesn't look right. Friends, that look, you know, doesn't look right on you, it doesn't look right on him, that's not good. Okay? So we can use ourselves as a reference guy. Or, you know, let's say it's a break, like it's trauma and they got a leg work. Well, how do you know her leg is broken? Well, look at their other leg. Is it matched up? One's going this way, the other one's going this way. Odds are it's probably not right. Okay. So do that for yourself. So that's vital signs, pulse rates. How do you measure pulse rate? How long do you measure pulse rate? 10 minutes, 30 minute. seconds when you're first doing it. After that, you're down to 15. Because again, you can make a lot of patient's condition. You might get a pretty normal pulse. And you can go 15 seconds, multiply it by what? Four. Or if you're 30 seconds, multiply it by two. Get your pulse rate per minute. It also assess the strength, quality, as far as it's regular or irregular, that kind of stuff. Um, blood pressure. Where do you think blood pressure comes at? Upper arm, bicep area. You need a stethoscope. Pump it up to what? Two hundred, preferably. You got a person with high blood pressure, you may put it on there, pump it up, so you don't hear it, and release it. <coughs> you start to hear it back. What's that pressure? What is that pressure? Systolic. Systolic. Okay. Really see more goes away. It's the LD. If you didn't use a stethoscope, you use this. Which one are you going to get? Just the systolic. Just the systolic. Okay. And then you can get a blood glucose level with pulse oximetry. We're going to teach you how to use a blood glucometer uh, here uh, in a couple weeks. Do the class, the next Saturday class. What is that? Next Saturday? No, that's not Saturday. Saturday yeah. after. Yeah. Um, we're going to let you play with every medication you got. Heavy pens, blue converters, um, inhalers, all that stuff. Because the thing is, and, and it's like I was, we had the two new guys who were tired. We were down here yesterday with my plans. And you got the trainers. The trainers are great. They ain't the real thing, trust me. When those real ones go off, heavy pens are pretty interesting. So you can play with those, and you'll actually get to play with the air like injectors yeah. that the sheriff's um, office have. We've got some uh, unique injectors with these uh, heroin. All right, so you do your assessment, you ask your questions, you start to treat your patient. You treat them, afterwards, five, ten minutes later, you're going to reassess them. Now, reassessment means what? What are you going to go back and check? And what else? Your interventions. Okay. Whatever symptoms they had, is it better or is it worse? If it's better, yay. If it's worse, oh, oh. yeah, we better back up and punt, hurry up, because I'm going down real quick, right? So check to see what needs to be done. If you need ALS, what do I call them? Immediately. Seven slides here, right? So get them on the way as early as possible. But if it's working, do I need ALS? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe one of those things where I can handle it myself. Because again, it goes back to the situation, which is closer. The hospital or the ALS. The hospital's four minutes away and the ALS unit's seven minutes away. Where do I go? Uh, hospital. Yeah, don't wait three minutes for the ALS to show up. Or like that. 
Make sure you document everything. Document what you had on the scene, document what you did, document how now what they're doing. And then again, whatever hospital you're going to go to, make sure you return that ahead of time. Now, for us, obviously, it's pretty simple. We've got one, and we're going to put it together. Outline areas, Warren, Chandler, uh, you may have to do some other stuff like that. Uh, medications, you're going to be taught in each of the chapters from here on out. So different medications are going to be able to do. So you're going to need to know how the medications are administered, what's the proper way, proper dosage, all that kind of stuff. may be on the scene for a medical patient longer than the trauma, just because it, you know, some of them may not be that major, like a headache. Is it a major issue for a headache? Maybe. Can be. Yeah. They've had a headache for the past six weeks. I think they can go six weeks in one day. I don't think that's too much of an issue. Now, if they had that much of an issue, you might want to wrap yourself up with some body substance isolation. They probably got some pressure. But at the same time, you know, you may be on the scene for a little bit of time. If you're having a major medical issue, chest pain, difficulty breathing, you know, three or four minutes on the scene, I'm in, I've got them in the ambulance, we're probably going to start going because I don't have ALS here. So think about what you need. Make sure you get whatever information uh, together so when you're talking to the doctors or the nursing staff at the hospital, you're giving them a picture of what this patient's complaint is all about. And they don't need to know all the medications they're on or you know, all their family history or anything like that. They need to know what's going on right now, what have you done for them, and how long are you going to be out. That's what they want to know. Then again, you may consider different routes, whether it be by ground or by air. Um, there are different protocols out there that say for patients like stroke victims, cardiac patients that are in outlying areas, the ground transport might be 25 to 30 minutes or longer. Get them in the air. Get them there in five or 10 minutes. That's a lot better for them. Okay? So uh, again, this chapter is just an introduction into the medical emergency stuff. Now, there are some other stuff that it talks about in the book as far as some different uh, diseases and stuff, and you need to look at those, especially when you get to the homework assignments, because those do uh, ask some questions on those. You know, we don't talk a lot about it in the infection control, I'm not sure why, about like you know, HIV and MRSA, hepatitis and tuberculosis and stuff, and there is some more information in these chapters, for this chapter here in the book, so please make sure you're looking at that. Um, okay. so, let's get into the rest of the We did airway last week, so now we're going into breathing. And understand that the predominant patient complaint that we're going to encounter is some type of breathing. They're going to be short of breath, or they're going to be breathing so excessive that they're not able to manage themselves. So you can't catch them. So, your job is to figure out maybe what's wrong with them, even though it's a very difficult process. It's not something that, again, you're not telling you, you've got to diagnose every patient. But you may be able to gather some information that will help narrow down what type of treatment I'm going to give to these patients. Because believe it or not, some of that over there is not recommended for every difficult treatment. It may just be the option. Or it may be the nebulizer. Or it may be just dealing with the hospital because they're beyond your scope of practice. So, we're going to talk about each of these different things here and give you some different clues to help you identify these patients. I can put some more videos into this. And uh, one of the things that Captain Grove said is, you know, we have a lot of video or imagery that shows what exactly these things are. So that's now been put in here. So but the first part is going to go through an anatomy review. It's going to talk about some of the different things, uh, structures and stuff like that. So this is just a, I think, an eight or nine minute video on a top end, I think it's a dissection.
a membrane called the mediastinum. If you have a better view, that is the mediastinum. This actually adheres to the, the back side of the sternum, or the posterior aspect of the sternum, this structure here. This mediastinum divides the thoracic cavity into two pleural spaces, and these are where the lungs reside. You have a right lung, left lung. The right lung is composed of three lobes, upper lobe, a middle lobe, and a lower lobe. Now this, once again, as I palpate the tissues, uh, they're nodular, they're hard, they're black because of nicotine. I can feel all types of lymph nodes in here that are just uh, horribly enlarged. I don't even really see this. This doesn't belong. There's all kinds of bumps and rough areas. You can feel them in here. These are all, uh, this is all cancer. All this black does not belong. A lump should be nice, bright pink, like bubblegum pink. And this is clearly uh, someone who's been smoking probably all his life. As I feel the lung, I can feel all kinds of uh, granular substances come off of that. So uh, that's a sick lung. On the left side of the pleural cavity, the lung is divided into two lobes, upper and lower. Here's the upper lobe, here's the lower lobe. The one thing we worry about in emergency medicine is when somebody aspirates, whether it's a pneumonia and an elderly person is aspirated because of feelings or something horribly has gone wrong in trauma and you think they've aspirated. Most times, because the trachea and a, and a bronchus bifurcate, uh, most times you'll have an aspiration on the right side of, uh, of the body or in your right lung because the bron bronchus is much fatter and more stout and shorter this is where most aspirations occur. It travels down to the right lung. In the pleural cavity, very thin membrane that adheres to the lung in the outside of the cavity uh, is called the pleura. There's also a membrane that goes around the heart, and it's called the pericardial sac. Thank you. 